uh, presentation. Unfortunately, uh, Rinku Gupta, who uh, is slated to give this presentation, is having some network problems this morning, so I'm going to um, cover it for her. I hope people won't be too disappointed with that. Um, also, one other thing that I wanted to ask folks, um, if you want to put a few words in chat to introduce yourself um, so that we know a little bit more about you and, and our presenters can introduce themselves too in this way, um, that would be a nice start on the, the interaction that we hope to have to learn a little bit more about you. So now we wanna give kind of a, a very quick overview of some of the motivations for these, this, uh, the material in this tutorial uh, and talk about how we approach this challenge. One of the fundamental messages that we wanna to convey today is that science through computing is at best as credible as the software behind it. This is a, a sort of a message that you'll see repeated throughout our presentations. Um, We've seen a lot of success in recent years in computational science kind of across the board, getting better understanding of, of complex physics phenomena. If you, you know, that motivates doing even more and we are able to build more and more capable hardware uh, and we have better math to go with it. And we get into this virtual cycle, virtuous cycle that's shown in the upper right where we're, um, we keep building ourselves up as a community, computational science community, but it also sets expectations higher and higher. And what we find these days is that things, software is getting so large and complex that really you need quite a variety of expertise to um, really do a proper job. And the only way in many cases is to approach that through a, a separation of concerns. You can't expect one person to know everything about a large complex software project. Uh, and so what we need to do fundamentally is to have a bunch of people who can work on the same software project uh, in different roles. And to do that effectively, you need some kind of software engineering process. And if you say, well, no, my team's really small, we get along well, we don't need a process. Um, actually, even if you don't uh, sort of uh, document it or set it out uh, explicitly, you still have a process. It may have accumulated over time, just the way you do things, but, but you've got some process going on. Um, and, and so it's worth thinking about that and thinking about it a little bit more systematically and how you, where it might be causing you pain and how you might be able to improve. And then we get into this uh, further situation, uh, especially in recent years, we've seen uh, a huge rise in the heterogeneity of the computing platform. So we've got GPU accelerators, we've got a lot more interest in FPGAs, other kinds of computers, quantum neuromorphic, other uh, AI processors. Uh, and, and the requirements here are unfolding and they're not known a priori. So um, the only real way to deal with these kind of challenges is to look ahead and invest in a flexible design and a robust, well-defined software engineering process so that you can focus your attention on the new challenges that are coming up um, and have, you know, be comfortable in, in dealing with uh, software engineering issues and, and things like that. And there are lots of challenges today. We have technical challenges as well as sociological challenges, right? On the technical side, we're dealing with these large codes and just about anything in the package can be under considered a, a research issue at any given moment. Requirements may change throughout the life cycle as our understanding of the problems and a desire to deal with new things uh, comes in. Verification, uh, we're mostly dealing with floating point code representing physical phenomena in one, one way or another, and the verification of those types of algorithms can be uh, particularly challenging. Uh, and basically the real world that we're trying to model is messy. And so as a result, our software also 
ends up messy. And then there's this issue of the architectural diversity that I referred to. And on the sociological side, there's competing priorities and incentives. Um, our sponsors, unfortunately, often care more about the publications or the scientific output than the quality of the software per se. We have to balance uh, the development that we do um, and the maintenance that we do with the new research that we we produce. We have limited resources to do this with, and we need to interact with a bunch of different people from different disciplines. Um, and that can be a challenge sometimes. So there's a lot of concerns here. And we've all heard about a, a variety of challenges where failure to attend, uh, pay adequate attention to details of the software has led to um, unfortunate consequences. In some cases on the left is an example where people have actually died because of inadequate attention to testing and software engineering principles. On the right is uh, an example where we lost a very expensive uh, space probe because of uh, testing um, inadequate testing at a software interface. These are just two of the many examples out there. I'm sure you can come up with others. Um, but there are also more subtle impacts on scientific productivity that you might need to think about. And, and an example here is uh, a while back from the Flash Astrophysics team, they were offered an opportunity to access one of the um, fastest machines in the world at that time, a Blue Gene L, and uh, get a dedicated run. Uh, they had very short notice. They were given less than a month to prepare for a run that would run a week and a half. So they did some quick and dirty development of a particle tracking capability in the code. And uh, unfortunately, after the run, they realized that there was an error in the tracking uh, code develop, uh, due to duplicated tags due to, to round off. Excuse me, floating point round off. And um, so they actually had to spend six months to develop post-processing tools to deal with this bug. And so this is an example where even though the Flash project had a good software process in place, the situation that they were placed in um, meant that they couldn't apply the normal rigor that they did to their software uh, development and they ended up having to pay for it in the end. Um, so this is just another example, more subtle than some of the ones on the previous slide, but still very important. Fundamentally, what it com comes down to is this concept of technical debt. Like monetary debt, the more you accumulate, the harder it is to pay off. And it has increased all around the software that you're working with. Um, and it fundamentally reduces your software productivity, your ability to develop software at the pace and at the quality levels that you would like, and it impacts your scientific productivity. Um, another aspect for many of us is that we're working on large supercomputers that are provided by um, you know, various funding sponsors. These things cost a lot of money and it takes a lot of effort to get an allocation on them. Even if you don't have to actually pay for that allocation, uh, you wanna make sure you're being a good steward of these resources. You wanna show the sponsors that you're, you're doing a proper job with the resources they've given you. And for your own sake, you probably wanna to try to get as much uh, science out of the allocation that you're given as possible because these allocations are precious. So there's a lot of reasons to think about good, um, good software. Our experience is that good scientific process requires good software practices. That feeds back. Good software practices increase software sustainability, increases um, software uh, scientific productivity, and so um, you, you get better results in the long run by paying attention to your software. What are good software practices? Well, there's no fixed or universally agreed to set of best practices for scientific software. The specifics will depend on your software, how it's used, who's on the team and things like that. But there are a few examples that we can look at to get uh, some ideas. And so I'm not going to have time to go into these in detail, but there's a paper from Greg Wilson and others. It's called Best Practices for Scientific Computing. Um, 
and, and some of the high level messages they advocate there, write programs for people, not computers, let the computers do the work, focus on incremental rather than um, large changes, don't repeat yourself uh, and plan for mistakes. Also optimize the software only after it works correctly. They talk about design, uh, documenting the design and purpose, not the mechanics. Uh, and they talk about collaboration around the software. There's uh, a follow-up paper to this called Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing because the, their experience was that the best practices could sometimes be hard to follow. So they wanted to step back a little bit and say, well, what's good enough? And they advised some practices in terms of data management, in terms of, um, so this is the process of doing science with the software, in terms of the software itself, uh, in terms of how to write manuscripts, in terms of how to collaborate with your colleagues, how to organize a project, keep track of changes, et cetera. Um, and then another example is that the Linux, uh, Linux Foundation has something called the Core Infrastructure Initiative, which has a best practices badging program. This is not something like the previous two, they were focused on scientific software. This is not specifically intended for scientific software, but it's a useful set of principles to look at as well. They define three levels of uh, capabilities basically, and it's a combination of must and should criteria. And so the, the kind of things that they look at are um, you know um, having a project website, having uh, a license, basic documentation, um, other other aspects of that, having uh, change control, bug reporting, quality control um, in in a larger Linux uh, in a larger context. Security is often a consideration, and this is something that is also coming up more and more in scientific computing, as especially as we get to more and more into workflows and distributed computing, and things like that. Uh, they advocate for the use of uh, static analysis and dynamic code analysis and, and things like that. But an important thing here, especially with this, these last set of ideas from the Linux Foundation, is that software engineering advice taken from the larger world often needs adaptation for scientific software. So um, the experiences reported in the wild uh, may apply to other contexts uh, but they don't necessarily consider the special nature of scientific software. That doesn't mean that we should ignore all the other software engineering experience that's out there. There's a lot of useful concepts and approaches and tools. Um, and many of those we can just pick up, but we need to be thoughtful about it. And we also need to recognize that in some cases, it might be useful to adapt these ideas and some of them just might not work. So we encourage, first and foremost, a thoughtful uh, approach to what your project needs. Be ready to adapt processes so that they work better for you and your situation and your team. Don't be afraid to experiment with these things. And there was actually a tutorial yesterday by some of our colleagues from the Ideas Project on the PSIP process, which I'll have a slide on in a second to recap. Um, but then, so we've all this talk about software engineering. So the question comes up, how much time and effort should I spend on software engineering? And our advice there is that your project should include just enough software engineering so that you can meet your short-term and longer-term scientific goals effectively. More than that is icing on the cake, but if you have um, research commitments, you're trying to satisfy sponsors with, with research goals and things like that, this is really, um, what you should be thinking about, helping ensure that you can succeed in those scientific goals. So this PSIP process that we talk about is a process of continual incremental software process improvement. So um, the strategy here is to identify your team's pain points in the software development process. There are some tools that can help you do that set a goal for something to improve. You should target processes and behaviors, not just tasks that need to be done to make the software better. Pick something that's modest in size that you can address in a few months and will give you a noticeable benefit if it succeeds. Uh, agree on a plan and how you're going to um, identify that you've made progress and when to how to define done. 
Um, and those you can write up as something called a progress tracking card. And um, then you work to your plan, you track your progress with the progress tracking card. And when you achieve your what's what you consider to be done, you celebrate. And then you can pick a new pain point to address. And the whole goal of this process is to incrementally bend the curve. So instead of you know making straight line progress, try some new things and hopefully they'll help you lower the cost of your software development processes in the future. Um, so there's a link to resources about the PSIP process. And um, as, as I mentioned before, we have this site, bssw.io, that provides general resources and things to think about for improving your software development processes. So in today's tutorial, we're gonna talk about a, a variety of topics. We don't have time to cover everything that we might like to. So we're gonna talk about agile methodologies. We're gonna talk about uh, a little bit about Git workflows as a way of collaborating around software. We're gonna talk uh, about testing software in a couple of different modules, uh, some scientific software design. Uh, that's the morning, then in the afternoon, we're gonna come back and talk a little bit about refactoring of software and the refactoring process, have kind of a whirlwind discussion of reproducibility, uh, and then we'll have the time we talked about to do the hands-on and discussion and things like that, which will be very free form. <laughs> 